As I was sitting over there, I got a text message that Chuck Jones, who is a local guy here, he is uh, in his final stages of life. And um, yep, Lindley, we're so honored to have Josie here this morning. And uh, we're going to dedicate her in a, in a week or two or three or four. And she's going to give a testimony again. You didn't get out of it, okay? But it's just amazing what happens when God's in control, when you let him take over and you offer yourself as his tool and as his instrument. Dear God, we come to you now and we just ask that you just continue to bless us, continue to speak to us, speak to our hearts, our minds, our souls directly, dear Lord. And let us come away with the true meaning of your word this morning that you have planned for us. And then give us the opportunities, the strength, the encouragement to go out and to live it so that we may be your living examples on this earth. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Yes. Trish Stilly died, correct? Yeah. Lots of prayers for her. Yeah, but Trish, Trish Stilly's kind of an icon. She's been... Um, there for a lot of people and their pets, and then, you know, um, pets become part of our family and we love them, and Trish was always an advocate for animals and always there for, for uh, everybody to take care of their animals when you couldn't, and so, and Ralph, and they, they're members here, so we lift them up and continue to pray for them. Thanks for reminding me of that. So, um, we're going to continue talking about revival. Um, last week we talked about in order to have revival, we have to truly understand what revival means and uh, what the Bible lays out as the biblical de definition and foundation of what a revival is and what's encompassed in a revival. And then this morning, we're going to hit on, a, on a, another element. And this is kind of an element that uh, I think is pretty appropriate for the, for the times. Anytime we talk about revival, a lot of times we look outward. And I know in the older days... And I've had the opportunity to preach some revivals. I preached a revival in a nursing home one time. I don't know if you guys know that or not. And, and it was a, it was a four-day revival. It was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and we finished up on a Saturday night. And one night they brought this lady in. It was a different crowd every night, and sometimes they were big, and just depends on what was going on. And, and I was getting going and getting started. And they had brought this lady in, and they kind of put her in the back, and she was in a wheelchair. And she started saying, I can't hear what he's saying. And so she was like inching forward, and I would talk a little bit. She'd say, I can't hear what he's saying. And she kept inching forward. But they had brought in a oxygen tank that helped her breathe. And uh, the more she inched, the more taut that line got. <laughs> And then right at, it was kind of a, it was kind of a emotional and climactic part of the sermon. That thing finally took all it could, and that was the biggest air tank I'd ever, I don't, it took three gals to carry it in. And that thing fell and hit that floor, and everybody jumped. We had three salvations right after that thing hit the floor. That's for sure, all right? <laughs> but um, a lot of times when we talk about revival, we look outward and say, hey, you know, a lost world needs to, needs to come, and, and we'll show you how to do it. But today, the Bible kind of lays out how revival starts, and uh, it's strange, and it's almost uh, kind of a gut punch, is that the Bible teaches that in order for us to go out and be instruments of change, to be instruments of love, mercy, and grace, we have to first be witnesses of that stuff. And we have to be witnesses of Jesus' love. And a lot of times today we get into these, we will call them um, conversations, okay? And uh, social media kind of helps you get into conversations with people, all right? And sometimes they get heated, and sometimes you get a bunch of people that you never heard of start jumping in, and next thing you know, the whole thing's blown up. And that's kind of how we tend to communicate a lot of times. A lot of the communication is not done face-to-face. There's no example. You, sometimes you're like trying to figure out, who, well, who is this person? I've never heard of them. And you're looking, and, and, I, and it's just craziness. And the point gets lost, and then there's just a bunch of emotions that get fed. 
And here's the, here's the, the reality of the situation is that you just get pushed further into your corner of belief. So where you started from, nobody changed your mind. You ever been changed by a Facebook post? Anybody's ideas or theologies or the way you live ever been changed by a, by a Facebook meme? Has that ever happened in the history of the world? No, right? Okay. So, and, and I'm being a little fetishious here or a little, having a little fun with it. I understand. Okay. So don't, don't, don't send me too many emails. All right. Don't send me too many Facebook memes trying to change my mind. All right. No. All right. But the Bible's pretty clear and it's pretty direct. It's like, hey, listen, if we're going to change the world, we got to show them what the change is. I mean, it's hard to, it's hard to project love when you're projecting love in an angry way. All right. So I'm going to be out of Second Timothy. And you got to remember what this book is, what this letter is. This is a letter written to it's, you know, from Paul to Timothy who he declared to be his son. Timothy was a young guy, was a young preacher, and uh, he gets these letters from Paul, these letters of encouragement, these letters of uh, instructions, and there's a lot of teaching going on inside of these. And this is, and if you read the book of Timothy, both books of Timothy, you come away with a pretty good understanding about what's supposed to happen in a church. How do you grow a church? How do you change a community through a church? And there's a lot of instruction. These books are really, really well written, of course, and there's just stacked full of instruction and theology. I'm going to be in about the middle of the second chapter here, and it says, uh, "Remind them of these things." Okay, so first off, we are talking about revival. Okay, and we're talking about a change that we can take out into a lost world, and if you realize. This is the second week that we've been talking about revival, and we're still talking inside the walls. So this is starting out, and he's still talking to believers here. So that, that should be one thing that pops out right from the get-go, is that when you start talking about revival, we want to say, hey, let's go out and, and change the lost world, and let's bring them in, and let's teach them about Jesus. But the underlying point that is being made here is that we have to first have an inside revival before anything can break out the walls into a community revival, into a world revival. It has to start here. And the old-fashioned saying is if you want to change the world, look in the mirror and change that guy first or that gal first. Or some people have said... If you want to have a revival, draw a circle around yourself and have one inside of the circle first before we step outside of the circle and try to change the world. So we're talking still, the first part of this is still talking inside of the walls, talking to believers. And it says to remind them, okay? I don't know how your parents spoke to you, but sometimes when we talk, when me and Ariane talk as parents, sometimes when I say, hey, we need to remind the kids this is something that they have been taught and they're not doing. And this is kind of like the last like nice guy approach. Like after this, I'm going to physically remind them. OK, so he's speaking to him. He's like, you need to remind them of these things, charging them before the Lord not to strive about words to no profit to the ruin of the hearers. Those are pretty stark words to start out from. And here's what's being said is that we as Christians have declared ourselves to be changed, to be different. And here's what you need to ask yourself. Here's what I'm asking myself this morning, is that if I'm looking around the world and I'm looking around at a lost world and I don't see a difference between the way that I handle trials and tribulations and the way that the world handles trials and tribulations, then I might want to start inside the circle and say, hey, there needs to be something going on with me before I can ever suggest a change to somebody else. Okay? I mean, I'm not saying that we have to be perfect. I'm not saying that we won't mess up and we won't let people down. But our approach, our theological, our foundational approach, our attitude about things has to be different. And if our verbiage, if our conversations are exactly the same stuff that's going on out in the world, we're not going to change anybody. We're not going to be identifiably different than the rest of the world. 
And so if you're seeing an argument of rage and hate, and I jump in with more rage and hate, what are you going to think about me? That I'm full of rage and hate. Who's going to see grace, mercy, and love in me? Who's going to be seeing any kind of identifiable change from Jesus Christ in me? And that's what it's saying, is that a lot of times we strive around about we put out all this effort for all these words and all these conversations that absolutely have no profit in them. And if you work and work and work and give out a bunch of effort for no profit, what good is it? And then it says there, adds this one. Not only is there no profit, but it actually ruins, it actually hurts the attitude of the hearers. And if sometimes you see people who you've tried to get to come to work or to church that you work with or that you live around, sometimes what they say is, oh, yeah, I went to church and there was nothing, a bunch of hypocrites there. You know, you get that kind of stuff. And what we need to understand is, yeah, you know what? There are a bunch of hypocrites in church, but we are hypocrites that hopefully have been changed, okay, and that we can show identifiable factors that we have been changed by Jesus Christ. Because if we don't, if we just chime in like the rest of the world, then it actually says that we can ruin the hearers. Okay? So then it goes on. And we're going to backtrack a little bit, get some foundational stuff. Remember that Jesus Christ, the seed of David, was raised from the dead according to my gospel. So this is some underlying instruction being given to Timothy. And this is what we need to build all actions, all conversations, everything that's inside of our life. And this is a point that I keep continually making to you and me, myself. This is the underlying foundation. This is the teaching is that every single thing that we do has to reflect that Jesus Christ is the answer to everything that was ever proclaimed in the Old Testament about curing sin, reaching the divide between God and man to be eternal life, the answer to all those problems that were laid out in the Old Testament, the answer to everything that was laid out in the New Testament, the answer to everything that is ailing the world right now, the answer is that Jesus Christ, who was the seed of David, meaning the promised Son of God, from way back in Genesis 3.15, we find the promise of Jesus Christ, and it says, was raised from the dead according to my gospel because he is Jesus Christ, the risen son of God. And everything that we do here has to be built on the foundational theology that Jesus Christ is the way, the only way to get to God. Nothing happens unless it goes through and it glorifies Jesus Christ. And our lives have to be built on that theology. Our lives have to project that promise, that change, that nothing else can happen, nothing good in this world can happen except that which is built on Jesus Christ. You can't build on any other thing except the foundation, that which is already laid, which means that it was laid before the world was ever created. Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is the Son of God. He is our Savior. He is our pathway to God. Nothing else happens except through Jesus Christ. Amen. There you go. Thanks. All right. And it says, for which I suffer. Now, here we go. This is one thing that you're always going to get with Paul. And he's going to remind you that life is real. Okay? And this is coming from a guy who is writing this. Now, understand he's writing this in chains. So as he's writing, I'm sure that as you read these letters and as you read these words, I want you to hear as the pen is being written, I want you to hear the rattle of the chains, not chains of bondage that are self-inflicted like most of us are, but this is bondage because he is being, he is suffering just like the evildoers, but he's doing it even to the point of chains. Can you hear the chains as he's writing the letter to us? Because he is a soldier of Jesus Christ. And here's the thing. You will suffer. You will suffer. You're going to suffer in this world. You're going to be persecuted. Jesus Christ says they're going to persecute you because of me. And you should glorify in the persecution because if you're being persecuted for your faith, it means that somebody has seen something in you that identifies your faith in Jesus Christ. Therefore, you're worthy to be persecuted because of your faith 
and reflection of Jesus Christ. Does that make sense? If you never get persecuted, it might be because Aaron doesn't reflect anything of Jesus Christ. So nobody has to persecute me because they don't even know I belong to Jesus Christ. Make sense to us? And it goes on. It says, this is a faithful saying. This is something that Paul writes all the time. And when he says these words right here, get your underlying out or, or whatever you do. If you don't write in the Bible, mark these words down or make these, put these in your memory. For if we died with him, if we accept his sacrifice at Calvary and we put our sins to death in Jesus Christ, then it says that we shall also live with him. That is the promise, is that if you're persecuted because of Jesus Christ, you will be glorified in the next life because of Jesus Christ. And you have to first die with Jesus Christ so that you can be arisen with Jesus Christ. And if we endure, if we can handle these things and do it in the right attitude, then we shall also reign with him. Why do we endure? So that Jesus Christ can reign. And we stand on the promises of Jesus Christ because he will not leave us behind, but he will bring us through and we will reign with him as he lifts us up. And it says if we deny him, he also will deny us. If we are faithless, now, man, there's, there's kind of a strange twist in the words there. If, he, if we deny him, then we don't belong to him. We don't get the privileges of belonging to him. And if we are faithless, because you see, the, you see the negatives on the first sentence, if we deny him, then he will deny us. All right, there's the, there's the negatives, but listen to this. But that doesn't change the character of Jesus Christ. That's what these next scriptures are saying here. Because if we're faithless, if we deny him because we have no faith, because we can't endure, we can't do the things that are required of us in this life, he's still faithful. Did you hear what I said? He's still faithful. Here's what's being said, and it's echoing what Larry said just a second ago. It doesn't matter what happens in this world. It does. Don't hear me wrong. It does matter, okay? But Jesus Christ is still the King of Kings. God is still in control. We know how the story ends, right? Here, here's, I, if you don't, I'm going to let you, I'm gonna, here's a spoiler alert, you ready? We win. Okay? We win. There's the deal. And it doesn't matter if your neighbor loses their faith, if your personal faith, um, the, the person that you look to to encourage your faith or someone that you model yourself after, if they even lose their faith and it hurts your faith, here's the thing. Jesus Christ is still faithful. Regardless of what happens in this world, regardless of all the horrible things that happen in this world, Jesus Christ is always faithful. His promises will come true. There is not anything that he can do that can deny himself. He can never change his character. We see good men fall down all the time because the best of men are men at best, right? And everybody makes a mistake. Everybody lets you down. Everybody will hurt your feelings. Everybody will say something that you don't agree with. Some people will shock you to the point to where you're like, I can't even worship with that person anymore. I get it. I understand it. But here's the thing. Jesus Christ is still faithful. Through all the bad, through all the good, Jesus Christ is faithful. He is a faithful Savior. Why? Because he cannot change who he is. He is God, the Son, Jesus Christ. There's not anything that can change it. And here's the good news about that. Not anything the world can do to change it. Nothing can change that Jesus Christ is our faithful Savior, Son of God. And here's what we need to understand. In the good times and the bad times, when it's in season, when it's out of season, when it's popular, when it's not popular, when it's being protested, when it's being encouraged, anything in every side of any situation, we are declared to preach the word. In season, out of season, be ready, convince, rebuke, exhort with patience and with teaching. When somebody's mad at you, guess what we continue to do here? 
proclaim that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. When a ruling comes down that we don't agree, agree with, guess what we do? We still preach the Word of God. When the world is rolling and we couldn't be happier and we couldn't be more satisfied with how things are going, guess what we do? Preach the Word of God. That is our constant here. Everything that we do here, we need to mandate in our spirit and in our heart that we will always preach the Word of God. We cannot be changed by the world. We will change the world because of Jesus Christ and because we will always preach the Word. I got the best little, best little blessing this week. We went to the Mexican restaurant in town Friday night. I had worked kind of late in... Arian and the kids and Pizzi, we met over there, and um, we got in there, and we were sitting down, and, a, and this little beautiful little family walked in, and two of the kids were our Wednesday night regulars. And they asked, if they asked me one time, they asked me four times, when are we getting to come back to church on Wednesday night? Do you know what that means? I think you're smiling. I can't tell behind your mask, right? Give me a thumbs up if you're smiling. There you go. All right. You know what that means? Those precious little kids are getting fed here. I understand it. They're getting fed twice. They're getting a good meal, and then they're receiving a meal of Jesus Christ, of love, of compassion, and mercy. And it has made an impact on them. And they knew me, and they knew Ariane, and the first thing they did was light up, and they came running over and they said, when are we coming back to church on Wednesday night? That means that that has become one of the most significant and important parts of their week. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. I, I can retire preaching now, you know it. I'm serious. If one person was ever changed because of anything, and I don't really do anything out here on Wednesday night except walk around and give thumbs up and stuff. Fill in every once in a while. I can't tell you the joy that was in their eyes when they saw us. Preach the word. Let's double down to preach the word. We need to be diligent. Always showing ourselves as approved to God. You know what that means? That means being a instrument, a reflection, a true reflection of Jesus Christ. Now I know you're sitting there thinking, I thought we were going to talk about revival today, big A. All you're doing is talking inside. This is how important we, as the instruments of Jesus Christ, as the witnesses of Jesus Christ, are in a true revival. Okay? This is how important it is. A worker does not need to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And here's the thing. Anytime you feel yourself have the urge to type in on a conversation, to join in on the conversation, the first thing that we need to do as Christians is what? To be slow to speak, quick to love. Take a deep breath, pray about it, so that we don't come off as another angry part of the world. That we can come off being changed by the word, having a different understanding than what the world projects. And that's what it's saying right there. If you go on, and you must first endure the hardships like a good soldier. Now, these are going to be tough words, okay? This is going back to the beginning of the chapter because this is underlying teaching that's happening here. And it says that you must first endure the hardships like a good soldier. Do you understand why he's picking the entity of a soldier to teach on here? It's not just because it's warfare out there, okay? But here's the deal. Have you ever seen, I, I, I wasn't a part of the military, and I'm thankful, aren't you thankful for our military and those guys that give their lives up? Huh? I've got Tori's boyfriend down there. I mean, we, we pray for him. I, I told myself I wasn't going to get attached to that boy. I said, he's just a boy, and doggone it, he made me love him. <laughs> I'll never forgive him for that. <laughs> okay, but... He picks a soldier because have you ever heard about a soldier when a general says, hey, we're going to go storm that hill. You see those cannons that are just blazing at you and all those guns that are blazing at you? We're going to storm that hill on three. You ready? And they all go, ah, I don't think we're going to. 
Hey, anybody here want to storm that hill? No, no. Hey, we took a vote. We don't want to. What? That doesn't happen, right? Here's what's being taught here is as Christians, as soldiers of Christians, we're probably going to have to do some things that we don't want to do and that aren't great to us. And here's, and I'm, I'm sorry, this is a point where I'm going to apologize to you for being so blunt, okay? But sometimes, and I'm as bad as anybody, I get my feelings hurt because I want this done that way and you made me feel bad or that, and I, and I do this and this and it's not right. And guess what Jesus Christ is doing? You're a soldier for me. You're going to have to take some hardships. You're going to have to do some things that aren't good. Somebody's going to have to hurt your feelings, and you're going to have to just keep rolling on. You're going to have to let it bounce off of you. Don't let it sink into your soul. If that's all it took, then, good Lord, it had been over generations ago, right? If a little hardship and, and hurt feelings is all it took to destroy faith and Christianity, that's not what we're all about here, right? And we're going to have to do some things that maybe don't sound the greatest to us and maybe don't make us feel great and might hurt our feelings a little bit. And it says that that's what we do because you have to live like a soldier. You have to take the, you have to take the hill when they tell you to do it. Even if you don't want to do it, sometimes you got to do it. You don't do it for yourself. You do it for the glory of Jesus Christ. And if anyone desires, these are the very words of Jesus Christ. If anyone desires to come after me and, and be one of my disciples, what do they first have to do? What's the first thing? Deny himself. Put off all your wants and needs, and now you take on the wants and needs of Jesus Christ. And you pick up your cross, and you follow him forever and ever. But shun profane and idle babblings. That's what the Bible refers to unproductive, unprofitable words, babblings. Let me ask you this. Anybody heard any babblings recently? Well, they will. And, and, and here's, here's, the, here's the process, okay? The only, thing, the only thing I can accurately associate with this is uh, when I deal with families and I deal in marriages and maybe sometimes do some one-on-one, -on -one, counseling with some guys and I think the worst the worst thing inside of a marriage and inside of a family one of the not the worst but one of the worst things that can hit is like a, a porn addiction okay I'm sorry if there's kids in here and whatever okay but when you get into that that like changes the whole reflection of the relationship and here's what I mean by that when, when they start talking to me about where the where they've gotten to and what's going on it's gotten to where it keeps escalating. It is a, it's like a true drug. Like one hit won't do it. It's got to get weirder. And, I mean, it's, it's horrible stuff. But it, it, it's, it's an addiction. And, and it changes the whole face of the relationship. And what normally would go on inside of a marriage can't anymore. Because that level has been increased. And now the, the, the hit, the high that they got to get... It's beyond anything. I mean, it, it's, it's a terrible addiction. And it is so destructive. And here's what's being said here. Is that when you get inside of these profane and idle babblings, what's going on into the world, guess what? You can't just stay there. You can't just rev up the crowd. And then the next week you can't come back and rev up the crowd with the same stuff. They've already heard it, right? You got to rev them up a little bit more. You got to keep adding more. If you're revving them up with anger, you got to get more angry. If you're revving them up with hate, you got to hate more. You got to broaden your hate. Okay? And if you're beating people down, you got to push them down harder. It increases. The evilness has to increase. That's not Aaron Phelps. You don't like this. Don't take it up with me. It's in the Bible right there. They will increase to more ungodliness. It has to. The appetites grow. Anybody still eat like the kitty meal at McDonald's? No, right? Have you seen what we serve nowadays compared to what was served when McDonald's started? Like when they started, they were, hamburgers were like that big. Now you like can't get your mouth on them. You're like, okay, like pushing them down and stuff. Because we keep increasing. The appetites keep increasing. 
Now, I'll just be honest with you, I could eat 47 cheeseburgers right now. I haven't had one since 2016. Can you believe that? Isn't that terrible? Huh? But that's what happens, is it has to increase. And their message, here's the deal. Their message, this is biblical, it spreads like cancer. It sweeps across the land. That, I don't have to, I mean, it, it's, what would be the word? Contagious. I'm playing a little bit there, sorry, okay? But this stuff is contagious, man. It sweeps across the world. And you can't control it. And once it's out of the bag, it's out of the bag. And it's got to keep increasing. And those who can keep increasing and keep revving it up, they stay on top. And it says there that their message will spread like cancer. He actually calls out two dudes right there. Okay, we won't get in the middle of all that. But he's called them out. And it says that they overthrow the faith of some. And here's what's horrible about this deal. Is that some people in their faith is not strong enough to handle the cancer and the hatred or whatever's being spread. They can't handle it. It's dangerous stuff here. And it says, nevertheless, and then he comes back to it. Nevertheless, guess what we are still built on? Guess what can change everything? Guess what can stop it all right here is the very foundation. The Lord knows who we are, that we are his, and everyone who names the name of Christ Jesus will depart from their iniquity. Amen? Jesus Christ is still, even after all that ugliness that I just talked about, guess what? The reminder is that Jesus Christ is still the Son of God. And the world will never defeat him. And there's not anything that can throw at us to separate us from the love of God. And it says here... Keep yourself free from all the horrible things out there. Pray against those. Ask for forgiveness. Okay, call on the, the Lord out of a pure heart with no personal motivation, with no personal agenda. Lift yourself up. And it says there, this one's probably pretty applicable today, right? Avoid foolish and ignorant disputes. <laughs> The Bible actually says that, okay? I about died right there real quick. <laughs> I, got so, I got so excited about it, I almost fell off the stage. But avoid, it, it, that's real, look it up if you don't believe me, okay? <laughs> but avoid foolish and ignorance disputes. That's almost like saying the word Facebook in Scripture right there, right? <laughs> Sorry, I tickle myself sometimes. <laughs> Why? Why do you want to avoid that stuff? Guess what all it does? It generates strife, really. <laughs> it really does? <laughs> it does, okay? All right, I got to I got to collect myself. This stuff's too good, right? It's too good. It's too true. We're hum aren't we so predictable. Are humans predictable or what? Huh? And then, and then you subsect us into men. Are men predictable or what? <laughs> Isn't that terrible? All right. I broke my thing. I laughed so hard. Okay. In a servant, now, now listen, here's, here we go. Okay. Now that we've beat ourselves up and, and we've reflected really, really hard here. Okay. Then here it comes. Here's the true teaching of revival. And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Okay. You can't be that guy or gal. You can't be that guy. You can't be, a, you can't be a fighter. You can't be an instigator. Not be a reflection of Jesus Christ. It can't happen. Now, does that mean that you shy away from falsehoods? No. You just saw where he called out two dudes, right? I mean, he called them by name. He didn't give a nickname or allude to them. He called them out. And it says that you have to not quarrel, but speak in a way that is gentle to all. Treat everybody gently. Okay? Able... And you have to do it in such a way that you don't make them hate you, you don't make them scream back at you, but you can actually teach. And again, guess what you have to have as you're doing this? Isn't that a terrible word right there? Patient. In humility. Whew, that thing's on shortage right now, isn't it? Humility. Correcting those who are in opposition. And then here it is. Here's what I really need you to hear today. I built this all up for this one point right here. And this is scripture. This is not Aaron Phelps. This is scripture. Look it up. Okay. If God perhaps 
will grant them repentance. Did you get it? You see what happened there? I'm going to read it one more time for you, and then we're going to make the point. If God perhaps will grant them repentance. Who gives repentance? Who grants repentance? What's it say? God, right? We seek it. We ask for it. But who grants it? Did it say anything about us granting it? And here's why that's important. Because we know that, right? We don't grant repentance. That's not our job. Okay? Are you sure that we understand that? Because here's what, the way that it breaks down with the words. We need to understand that. So that they may know the truth. Why do we want them to have repentance? So that they may know the truth. And they may come to their senses and escape the snares of the devil. Having been taken captive by him to do his will. So here's what's happening here. Repentance, that word that was just used when we go back here, there it is, repentance right there. God will grant them repentance. Repentance is the Greek word metanoia. Metanoia means not just to be sorry, not just to be remorseful for what has happened. You're not just being sorry for what I did. We're not children anymore. We are spiritual adults. We don't just come up and say, I'm sorry. Oh, that's okay. That's not how it works. We have to truly be remorseful. What's it mean to be remorseful? Is that you actually have a change of mind. Your attitude, your thinking, the way that you perceive things have to be changed if you're truly remorseful. Otherwise, you're just playing the con that you played when you were six years old on your grandma, right? Who would forgive you for anything. Right, Connie? <laughs> I know you're a grandma, right? You ever hold a grudge on one of those grandkids? Absolutely not, right? Too cute. Absolutely. There you go. Okay. So, what I do? Hit a bunch of words there? Okay. So, the truth can only come through repentance. So, if you want someone to understand what we declare to be the truth, do you pound it into them with a fight and with a quarrel and with hateful words? Absolutely not. You present it in a way that they are remorseful. And they are remorseful to the point that they have genuine change of mind and then the truth becomes apparent to them. And who makes that possible? Not us, but God. It can only be granted by God because of the work done at Calvary by Jesus Christ and it's delivered to each and every one of us on earth through the Holy Spirit. It's not done because we yell at people or that we scream at people. In fact, it's not done through us at all. All we do is speak to people in a loving, caring way because we want them to know the truth. And the truth becomes obvious to them when they become remorseful and they ask for forgiveness and they have a, remorse, a remorseful attitude to the point to where that they change the way that they think and then the knowledge that comes only through Jesus Christ comes to them and in fact it's backed up Jesus Christ when Peter had a remorseful heart did he leave him there no he said this came this is a uh, blessed are you Peter for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you no man argued with you do you realize what you did was wrong Peter when you denied Jesus <laughs> He knew that. He had a remorseful heart. It changed. And then, but who made it evident to him? Not flesh and blood, but it was real, revealed to him by God the Father. All true knowledge comes from God, brought to us by Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit on an individual basis. Galatians says that, Jesus, that God is happy to reveal his Son in me that I might preach among the Gentiles. I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Where did the knowledge, where did the truth come from? God. Revival is a God-given change. But that doesn't mean we tap out and say, all right, God, go for it. Let's have revival. There's a lot on us. But we have to do it in the correct way. We have to be different than the rest of the world. We can't be more angrier than the world. We can't be more despicable than the world. We can't be sadder than the world. We can't be softer than the world. We have to have a gentle, loving spirit. If you act out of love, you won't go wrong. True Christian love. 
you won't go wrong. This is a tough sermon. This was a tough one to write. I'm just going to be honest with you, I pushed it off all week because I didn't really want to get into it because I knew what was into it. I didn't want to have to hear those words in my own head. It's tough. It's a tough time. So I'm going to ask you to stand this morning. If you think this world is going down the tubes, it's time for us to love more, to care more, to be more patient so that we can teach through example, through witness, through love. If you think this world is, is in a bad spot, then I'm, I'm asking you to join me down here on the altar as we pray for me to be changed and for you to be changed in such a way that we go out and everybody that we come into contact with are changed because Jesus Christ is living through us. So at such a rate that, like the Bible says, we turn into a fountain where everybody gets wet. So I can hit you with an emotional tale. I can hit you with something. I'm, I, I'm just going to do this. I, the word is out there. It says... We have to be the change in this world. Are we prepared to do that? Are we prepared to soldier up? Because guess what? Sometimes you got to storm the hill and you don't want to. There's too much going on there. So I'm asking you this morning, if you don't feel like coming up, stay there, kneel down where you are, just pray where you are or whatever. But let's be the revival, but it has to start with us on a personal level so that we can be the witness, the living example of Jesus Christ in the world. I open up the altars to you this morning.